activity at the end. Um, but what came up in our more recent conversations is why don't we sunset the program altogether for ninth grade and look at the curriculum separately, not saying we want eighth grade to end like achievers. Uh, that is, that's not unanimous support of the steering committee. So I want to be clear that um, there wasn't a big group huddle and said, and said, everyone said yes. Uh, the student who's on the group really spoke very eloquently about what the program means to her, specifically with the student relationships. Because if you think about the identification process, some students are identified as early as first or second grade. They go through a program for all of these years with this peer group. We know one of the great benefits of a gifted program is time with typical peers or like-minded peers. And then those relationships go away because you're in a big high school. So if we still want to really pay attention to providing that time and space, we did talk about potentially a club uh, for students. So there's a regular network and time for them to come together um, more socially than anything else, uh, because so few students have been accessing the program over time. Uh, we're starting to see some attrition in eighth grade, and then really in ninth grade, it's uh, it's a small percentage of students relatively that end up going forward with the program. Uh, so that was the original uh, recommendation. Uh, right now, we do have uh, the, the cuts in the budget are looking at the program not continuing next year. What that means is we would have the program continue as it is for next year at the middle school, and then we would be looking at the changing the curriculum over time. The identification process is one of the other considerations that came from the report. Uh, in our at our last meeting, we actually we turned this over to the steering committee, as this is going to be their charge, is to look at uh, best practices in this area. So we're working that out at the moment. Uh, two things specifically, one of them is uh, really looking at the identification of talents, because we know a best practice. Uh, our program is really right now a gifted program. We haven't really called ours a gifted and talented program because we're looking at the academic portion more than we are talents. So they are exploring uh, what are the areas of talent we might consider identification and what are some best practices uh, in doing that. Uh, we're also having conversations about once students are potentially identified as talents, are we necessarily providing services or are we making sure we're communicating with teachers so they can nurture those talents in given areas? For example, if someone's musically talented, artistically talented, uh, is there a service provided with that or is this a how can teachers in the context of music and art classrooms uh, really tap into that talent and, and bring it forward? Uh, the other piece that has been uh, very challenging to manage is the off-year parent referrals. Uh, there are many off-year parent referrals. The gifted education teachers go through a process of evaluating students when it's not a year for the students to be screened. And it takes upwards of six hours per referral. And of the students that are referred on these off years, we have a range of I would say eight to 12 or 14 percent of that population ends up getting identified. So what we want to look at is, is there a better way on those off years to respond to that? Because we have so much, our gifted teachers are spending so much time evaluating when they could actually be spending time delivering instruction and providing programs to students. That's the greatest value we have in, in the program we have is when, when the teachers are working with students. Uh, so that's another piece that the steering committee is uh, going to look into. And I know our gifted education teachers have been, I think that was the first request they made, uh, and it came forth in the program evaluation as well. The other big piece was curriculum enhancement. A theme of the evaluation was uh, the middle school curriculum specifically. I would say there was a relatively high level of uh, parent satisfaction, specifically at the elementary school. And in the middle school, uh, there were questions and concerns about the middle school program, as well as the middle school schedule. So that's where we really want to take some of our initial steps. The reason we haven't moved faster, it goes back to the schedule. We were waiting for that change to happen, uh, but here we are two years later and we haven't done that yet. So we need to move forward, even though we aren't quite there with the schedule. Uh, so professional development is a, a big piece in doing that. Uh, we the districts worked with Holly Clark in the past on project-based learning. She was a keynote speaker for us about a year or two ago. So she's going to do some work not only with our gifted education teachers, but with uh, other educators as well. Uh, so looking closely at the middle school curriculum with her, and then uh, 
with with her wisdom as well, talking about the possibility of that eighth grade culminating experience. Uh, based on the conversations we've had, it's probably going to be helpful for us to not call a program achievers and rename it and just place it in another school. I think it's an opportunity to rebrand and developmentally and the structure of the schedule does limit students ability to uh, access the program the same way and the mentors the way that it's currently designed. And also looking at the uh, National Association of Gifted Children standards and making sure that the curriculum and standards aligned. I don't have this bullet up here as well, but it's been uh, there's been enough change in uh, administration that we probably want to look at the program itself and the vision and the goals and, and what it's for, uh, because that was all done before our district strategic plan and our mission vision core values. So we want to just do an alignment check uh, with all of those things. So I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you. So it seems like there's still a good chunk of work to be done on this. There's a huge amount of work and these items are just some of the primary considerations that were, were put in. So we have, this is a probably a five-year plan that the program evaluation gave us at, at minimum. At minimum, okay. So, I mean, I think that one of the major pieces is that middle school schedule. So when do you think that shift will take place and when do you think we can hear more about what's being proposed uh, i talked to uh, dr dahlstrom this morning and she said she's hoping this spring to make those recommendations and depending on the significance of what the schedule change would be like if there are budgetary impl impl implications we're looking out a fiscal year before those happen that doesn't mean that we can't start making adjustments to the curriculum uh, and we'll make the adjustments again, should there be more time that students have access to the program. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. Just to follow up on that, Chris, and maybe you don't know yet, but the um, the elective idea, because we don't really have electives at Middlesex. We so it's don't. So a that, different animal. So the, uh, the initial schedule that was proposed uh, by Shelly Summers in 2020, spring of 2020, uh, looked at having elective opportunities for students so they can make some choice and this was a a way to add more opportunities for choice to students and not necessarily add a ton of fte because there is space to accommodate that uh, space and schedules but not space in the building so that's the the balance that we're trying to find so we would have to have plenty of conversations of it, it is not common for students to have complete choice with electives because there's guaranteed experiences and uh, it's not the middle school model like the, the middle school model of you have art you have music you uh, so this would be uh, especially looking at seventh and eighth grade because i described the limitations of sixth grade students might have the guaranteed music or the guaranteed art but there's also another space for them to choose something else yes. Excuse me, Tara has her hand yeah. raised. Tara. Hi. Um, great. I also was questioning about the electives. Um, and although I would have to say, if you're going to start offering electives, is there a reason why kids have to take, you know, kids that are completely unartistic, that they have to take art, right? That someone may be more STEM-based and would prefer to spend their time there? I mean, just a just a thought. I don't know if that's a statewide regulation or not. I probably should. Anyway, um, I have a couple questions. Talking about enrollment dropping, where is that dropping? Just at the high school and that and that eighth grade, or is it all K to K to nine? There is a, I would say this, an initial drop moving from elementary to middle school, and then a larger drop during not only seventh to eighth grade, but I would say during the eighth grade year, uh, as students are changing during eighth grade and the social dynamic changes. Uh, and then the largest one is the eighth to ninth grade. Okay. So, so really it's mostly as it's been for a long time, it's about the schedule and kids not wanting to miss out on that social time with friends. Yes. And it's also usually male students that tend yes. to drop more frequently than female students. Right. Right. And I, and I, had, so, and I'm fine with the achievers at the high school situation and relooking in that. Um, but I think we should also realize that over the past few years, it's been very inconsistent. I know there was a lot of drop this year. I, I believe it started out with 20 kids. There were two sections and a lot dro dropped from one section. And from what I hear, it wasn't very consistent between the two. So, and that program has been like that at the high school. I think part of the problem is 
it really hasn't had one teacher managing it for a really long time. So it's really been all over the place. So kids' experiences have been very different. Um, the PD, is it also, because you talked about um, the gifted teachers having to look at all these kids that are coming on off schedule. So is there going, and part of that is because the classroom teacher is not really able to identify it all, to kind of look and say like, oh, that kid should, you know, be taking the test or being looked at for gifted. So is there going to be some PD for those regular ed teachers so that they know within the classroom that kid is hitting certain check marks that they should be looked at? Yes, that's also one of the, I think it was one of the prioritized considerations from the report as well. So absolutely. Okay, great. Um, sorry, I have so many questions. Uh, <laughs> Um, I see Genius Hour up there. I'm not sure how that is connected to the gifted. Um, I know it's basically a project based like achievers, but it is mandatory for everyone in the school. I see how it's school wide enrichment, but that's not looking at a specific set of students. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure why that's up there. Yeah, thank you for that. The I, I meant to mention that. So one of the considerations that came from the report was in addition to enhancing the gifted education program, what's deeply tied to the research, especially out of the Renzulli Center for Gifted Education, uh, is enrichment for all. Uh, so that was an op that's an example of where we've addressed enrichment for all. Uh, so that's a just a program programmatic enhancement for the entire well the entire middle school, but ideally those opportunities that exist across the district uh, and enrichment for all. Uh, there are some places do enrichment for all in place of gifted education programming. I want to be clear that we are not looking looking at enrichment for all as a program replacement. That's an, in addition to. Okay, and I think my last question is about how you are expanding or looking at different aspects such as talents when it comes to, and I, you mentioned a little bit that you're not sure how those students would be then serviced because are you planning on bringing art into the gifted program? I'm just a little worried that if we're trying to reach every single little thing that someone may have, that the program's not really going to serve anyone. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying there. I think the first step is to make sure that we are recognizing the talents that might exist within um, students and think about opportunities that we have to enhance those talents. And like I said, we don't need to necessarily provide specific services for them, but it doesn't mean that we can't work closely with those teachers who are aware that there are uh, unique talents within that skill set. Uh, a, a simple example, I re like when you provide give students a music aptitude test at an early age, you might see things in their aptitude scores that they're not exhibiting at all uh, on the day to day of their uh, classroom participation. Uh, but once you know that, it gives uh, it gives some insight into how you might uh, spend some time to try to tap into those talents in a different way. I don't think, and this is me just projecting, I don't think we would look at additional services for all of these things, because then it, I do think that the program loses some identity, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it's important that we recognize uh, talents that might exist within populations of students. I okay, agree. Thank you. I think that's it for me. This is best, Julie. Thank you. Um, Chris, do we tend to identify, I think we do, students coming out of fifth grade, so we have a new group of IDEA students going into the middle school. So do those balance out like do we end up having kind of a similar number of fifth grade idea students and sixth grade idea students because we lose some but we gain some I think the number is still down a bit because enough students don't take it I could I could look okay for sure uh, but I don't think that the number definitely does not increase okay um and then for the curriculum from my personal experience I just wanted to share having been a middle school idea mom for a while my exposure to the curriculum was generally the 10 minutes in the library during 
open house night mm -hmm. and that was a lot to try to take in in 10 minutes so i'm sure you're looking at it from a variety of lenses but the parent input piece i i would not have been able to speak eloquently about what i thought was great or not great about the middle school curriculum because again there was very limited exposure to we it. actually changed that this year okay so that's it for that reason thank you <laughs> i used to leave that library like what just anyway <laughs> and then the last thing i wanted to ask chris you had touched on this briefly but could you just talk a little bit more about about um, the middle school model, which is is not about choice so much. It's about prescribed. And so the middle school model, uh, especially team-based models, it's designed so students are, especially in larger schools, they have uh, a group that they travel with a cohort, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So you might have 100 students that have the same math, English, science, social studies teacher, uh, and they also tend to experience their uh, unified arts in the same way as well. So middle school is a guaranteed experience. And to Tara's great question about, well, why does it have to be that way when it comes to um, art and music and all of these things? That's a discussion that we certainly need to have. Uh, I think the philosophy that grounds the middle school model is that we want to provide students with similar experiences so they're prepared to make a choice when the time is appropriate. So the question becomes, when uh, are students ready to start to ex deeply explore areas of passion which also ties into the reason the middle school curriculum, uh, we're digging into the middle school curriculum. Uh, gifted uh, education is really about students exploring things that they care about most and diving deeply into what they want to learn more about. So choice and exploration and inquiry is a big part of uh, what we're looking toward. Okay, thanks. Can you remind us what is required of a middle school student? What must they take throughout their day? That's a really interesting question because there isn't too much guidance as to what is required at the middle school. We don't really get into state requirements until the high school. Okay. Uh, so math, English. So I think about it as what prepares students for what they're required to take when they get to high school. And that's math, English, science, social studies, world language. And there's an arts requirement as well. Uh, the spirit of high school reform when that originally came to be. 10 years ago, about 10 years ago. I think we're five years late in implementation. Uh, that's That was just delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Uh, it really was looking at trying to give more space for high school students to explore what they wanted to explore. Uh, but we've been battling the post-secondary experience and expectations hasn't really changed. Right. So if you want students to have more opportunity for choice, uh, but they are college bound, for example, um, there are certain things you have to do to prepare yourself appropriately for that. So that's the tension that continues to exist despite uh, a desire for students to have more opportunity, uh, not really doing the traditional path. Right. Um, Part of the challenge there too is uh, trying to expand the, the um, uh, requirements and also open up, like, open up opportunities, but they're still using the same old credit uh, system so, it gets, so one competes against the other. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, and there were wins and losses through that process because at one point, if you remember, Christina, I think it was a required two credits for world language and then it became one. So there's only one credit required for world language, but we know that most colleges want a minimum of three years and not only three years, but three years taking the same language. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that's a definitely a tricky trickle down situation. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about the off year parent referral. So it's interesting that would you, would you say eight to 14% are actually identified as gifted. So is there a parent education piece that we could work on before there's, before the program shifts? Because I think, you know, in, in this community of, of well-educated, you know, type A parents, everybody, I mean, not everybody, a lot of people think that their really smart kid is gifted when in all actuality, there is a true definition of giftedness. So how can we help you guys to not have to do those six hour referral processes if not necessary? So, so I will say that this year we also did a parent presentation and um, we offered it in person and through Zoom and we had a, a very, very large participation rate um, and went through the process and you know, what we even see and what it involves and kind of things to look out for. And we still have the same number of parent referrals. Okay. Yeah, and we actually have heard some things like parents have said they want, they would like the data. 
So they want to know how their, the students do. The design of these design of the assessments that we use for gifted and for gifted identification, um, the scores don't tend to fluctuate. That's the nature of of testing. So students are as the years go on, less students aren't more likely to be identified right. because these are these are difficult tests to prepare for because they're not looking at academic achievement. They're looking right. at other things. Right. Okay. Tara, your hand is still up. Do you still have questions? Yes. Uh, one question about, I'm wondering if, especially since it's more boys, you know, I have my theory that it's just the lunch and pull out and socialization, but I'm wondering if there's any exit interviews done with these uh -huh. kids to see if there's something else going on as well. You know, I don't believe there are, Tara, but that's a, given the number that have dropped this year, uh, and my experience with uh, sitting alongside of this uh, program evaluation, the most valuable part of that was talking to students through focus groups, and I think that might be an interesting focus group. Uh, I have a feeling they would be willing to to sit and talk. Yeah, I'd, I'd be not, curious. Maybe not at their lunch time, but I can yeah, find no. them. <laughs> I can find them another time. Thank you. Other questions? I can't see Dave. Dave, are you there? Do you have questions? I'm still here. The only question I would have is regarding the six hour evaluation. Could you just speak, Chris, to what that six hours is composed of? Um, Julie can jump in on that. It's not six hours in one setting. It's several different assessments. So Julie can speak more to that. Sure. We we use the OLSAT, um, which takes about an hour um, or an hour and a half. It's it's um, two sessions, depending on the grade. We do a degree of reading power. That also takes about an hour. We do a writing assessment. We do a Torrance test um, for creativity. There is a teacher piece. So each of those pieces, and especially for our younger students in first and second grade, we break it up so that they're not all sitting in one session. So it's a lot of time um, of testing and of pulling kids out of the classroom for that. Thank you. Okay. Further questions on gifted education? Oh, Tara's, Tara's got her hand up. Just curious. Um, being that they take, don't they take the OLSAT? I'd say first, third, fifth. Is that when they take the OLSAT? Third and fifth. Just third and fifth. Okay. So a lot of these parent recommendations, are they at the younger years? I'm just curious, you know, because once you have your third grade OLSAT, you kind of know how, and, and like Chris mentioned, they're pretty, they're fairly static, right? They don't change a lot being that yes. it's basically an IQ test. So yeah. is it seen at the earlier ages? Yes, a lot of first and second grade. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tranberg. We'll move on to Mauricio and World Language Update. Thank you for being here. Of course, thank you for having me. Oh, hello. Great, it works. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the members of the Board of Education Curriculum Committee for giving me the opportunity to present an update on our secondary world language program and to share with you some plans for the program's future. Today, I will briefly review our department's thematic approach to instruction and provide you with an overview of how our curricula are structured. I will then present a seal of I, <clears throat> I will then present on the seal of literacy and move on to a report of proficiency assessment scores from last year. This week we will begin our annual proficiency assessments in grade eight. They actually start today at MMS, and we'll continue with seal of literacy proficiency assessments in the high school in March. And then I will share an update on how we are progressing with the incorporation of new courses at MMS and DHS and how we are preparing to bring on the courses approved in November for the 2023-2024 school year. And finally, a brief update on where we are with um, current and upcoming curricular revisions and an update on our international trips, my favorite part. 
So first, a thematic approach to curriculum. In the world language world, we call this the themes bloom. All across the United States, world language programs like ours are governed by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages Standards for World Language Instruction. And 10 years ago, as programs sought to accelerate language instruction and open access for more students to study languages at a higher level, the College Board's AP program synthesized all of those standards into this Venn diagram for world languages. The diagram makes it easy for us to visualize what our students learn and categorize it into wider, broader themes that are all connected. Six years ago, we here in Darien made the transition to each course exploring one theme per marking period. In this way, our students are able to take a deeper dive into the material over a longer period of time and truly master it. To illustrate this with an example, I'll use food. Uh, where we previously had a two-week unit on food as a superficial topic, uh, where students were expected to master a ton of vocabulary words in 10 school days, we now have a nine-week thematic unit on contemporary life, where we explore how to make healthy food choices, how to describe food preferences, and the historic origins of ingredients used to make certain cultural dishes. And I shared this information in my update last year and nothing has really changed, but I included it here just in case. Um, so to that end, our curricula are structured in the order you see here. In addition to making a shift to thematic instruction six years ago, we also made a shift to backwards design, which our department in a, uh, which put our department in a good place to move into EduPlanet right away. Our units begin with unit overview and supporting information for teachers. This is where we tell the story of a unit, the why uh, behind what we teach, and um, provide notes for instruction. Uh, for example, our sixth grade curricula begin with a unit zero, which is intended to acclimate students to five days of language instruction at middle sex, and more importantly, how to be an organized, independent middle school student in a French, Mandarin, or Spanish class that aims to speak in the target language for the whole class period and meets every day of the week. Then we list our essential questions and supporting questions, which act as a frame for the things students will learn. And by the end of each unit, students should be able to answer each of those questions using new linguistic skills they've acquired and eventually take those skills with them into the next unit and in the next school year and beyond what in the UBD world we call transfer goals. And then we list out acquisition goals as commonly referred to as essential knowledge or a toolbox. And here is where we explicitly state everything the students will learn, vocabulary, grammar, and linguistic function. So if you think back to your own time, perhaps in a world language class when you were in middle school or you were in high school, um, your classes were probably structured with this at the beginning. Um, in a backwards design model, vocab and grammar um, are used to do something within the broader context of a theme. So to listen, to speak, to write, and to read with accuracy about what they're learning and are not the main uh, drivers of instruction. And, oh, wait, no. <laughs> and one more. And finally, our curricula end with links to resource folders and common assessments that are stored in Drive and internal instruction notes where teachers memorialize notes about how to tweak lessons based on student performance and common assessments within a unit and make recommendations for curricular shifts into the future. Um, we have also now added um, our district and board goals and initiatives. So for example, seal by literacy, vision of the graduate and a mastery based diploma. So all of those standards are, are infused and we add those as we add more um, content and curricula into EduPlanet. And all of these, um, things that you see here are currently summarized on the curricula at a glance, public facing documents, which are on our department's curriculum webpage and will eventually make their way um, onto EduPlanet. And I'll share um, more about what this means for our department in EduPlanet as I review the new courses. Um, to transition quickly to Seal of Biliteracy, uh, the Seal of Biliteracy is awarded to seniors at graduation. Uh, Darien High School has been part of the State of Connecticut Seal of Biliteracy program since its inception in the 2017-2018 school year with the class of 2018. And to prepare for today, I played back my presentation from last year uh, before I had these numbers, and I realized I made a, quite a bold statement. I said, 
I predict that this year we will have the highest number of SEAL earners since adopting the program in 2017, not only in number of students earning the SEAL, but also in the number of languages represented on our list. And I was right. Um, last year, we awarded the SEAL to 137 seniors, the highest since the program began and in seven different languages. And this is actually um, among the highest in the DERG, even though many schools are larger than ours. Um, as part of our desire to cast a wider net, we award the SEAL not only to students who learn a language in our world language program, but also to students that are heritage speakers of other languages at home. And we're able to capture this information through a school-wide survey um, at DHS where students self-identify as home language speakers and opt in to testing. And both our language learners and heritage speakers need to complete two steps to earn the SEAL. So the first step is completing the world language portion. In um, grades 10, 11, or 12, students must pass a language proficiency exam, and we test our students' proficiency in these grades as part of data collection and our general program. So the assessment serves a double purpose. We don't need to test them again and again and again. And the second is meeting the requirements for the English portion, which for us is to just meet the English requirements to graduate from high school. And no additional testing or data collection is necessary for this part of the SEAL. And if you'll indulge me in my charts for a moment, um, I would like to transition to our yearly stamp assessment and the presentation of completed scores from last year. And when I gave my program update last February, uh, we had begun testing at the middle school and high school and had preliminary data, but it wasn't complete. And as I mentioned before, we, get, we begin testing today at Middlesex and at DHS in March. So the standards-based uh, proficient uh, standards-based measure of proficiency, excuse me, or the STAMP as we call it, is a computer adaptive assessment that calibrates a student's proficiency level in four <laughs> skill areas. Students can score novice low, mid, high, intermediate, low, mid, high, and advanced low, mid, high. And you'll see in the upcoming slides that in some places I put range in parentheses, and this means that our students <laughs> scored within the range of low, mid, or high in that given level. So these are our scores from Middlesex, and despite COVID, um, these are the highest scores our eighth grade students have earned since adopting the assessment in 2018. And it not only highlights our students' efforts and their commitment to studying a language in middle school, but also my, my colleagues' effort as well, who you know have these students in their classes um, for the entire three years that they're in middle school. And in both languages, in French and in Spanish, our students are meeting or exceeding the target that we place for them. So for students in Middlesex, our goal is to get them out of the novice range as quickly as possible. In productive skills, such as speaking and writing, it is expected that our students will reach novice high and begin approaching intermediate by the time they leave in eighth grade. And the reason um, why students are able to score the way they do is because they have uh, language every day in middle school starting in sixth grade. And, um, and, um, and in Spanish in particular, you're like, why are they so high? Well, in Spanish, they start in, in kindergarten. And the data from DHS, which is now complete, represents a composite score of all juniors and seniors currently enrolled in these languages. So it was current at the time. The numbers are different now as we, as students move on through the program and take different courses, but this was the last year's juniors and seniors, so seniors earning the seal by literacy and current seniors um, at DHS. And an overwhelming majority, again, score completely and comfortably in intermediate and into the advanced range. So to earn the seal by literacy, you need a five on all parts of the exam. A five is an intermediate mid, um, a five or higher. And I won't go um, too much into this aspect of language learning because I could be here for you know several days talking about it and why, but um, most of them are intermediate. Intermediate is the level at which any language student, um, whether they start in kindergarten or whether they start in college, intermediate is where um, a language learner will spend most of their time. At this level, students are learning to 
um, not only communicate in all time frames, past, present, and future, but they also begin incorporating cultural and idiomatic expressions and also start to perfect pronunciation, which, take, which takes a very long time um, to break through into advanced. And on this slide, you'll also notice that Spanish learners are getting into the advanced range in all four areas because of how much time um, they spend in our program. So just to pause here really quickly, where I mentioned previously that I include range in parentheses, that means that, for example, in speaking in Spanish, if we look at 73%, um, in most 73% of students, juniors and seniors scored intermediate high or into the advanced range, so intermediate, low, mid, high. Um, but most of them, you'll see intermediate, high, and in French, all comfortably in um, intermediate and in listening comprehension, which which is interesting because listening comprehension is typically where language learners struggle the most. Um, they're comfortably in intermediate and also reaching advanced, very similar to listening in Spanish. And in Mandarin, and the reason why Alira is up there, Alira is the test that Latin learners take. Um, it only has reading and writing for obvious reasons. You can't speak. I mean, I guess you could speak Latin if you really tried, um, but we don't assess their speaking proficiency and we also don't assess their listening proficiency. But again, comfortably in intermediate. In um, Mandarin, it's expect, this is exactly what we would expect, novice high to intermediate range. Mandarin is a level four language. It's, um, doesn't have our alphabet. It's a tonal language. Word order is is different than than most um, languages that have Latin as a stem. So this is what we would expect a typical um, high school student to achieve. Um, students, um, the Mandarin Chinese, as I mentioned before, is a level four language among the most challenging languages to learn for non-native speakers. So we would expect students to begin approaching intermediate after three or four years. And thanks to the stamp in Mandarin, uh, we're able to make recommendations such as bringing Mandarin to Middlesex. And in two years, when we assess our first group of eighth graders, um, we'll be able to more accurately predict their proficiency growth into the future. And just a plug on behalf of Dr. Dahlstrom and myself, thank you. Um, for supporting our program's growth um, with the addition of Mandarin 6. And I'll have more about that later, but um, it's incredible what they're able to do in that course. Uh, new courses running this current school year. So I'll start with AP Spanish um, Literature at DHS. Um, I won't go into too much detail here um, because you're already familiar with it from the proposal from last year and also as a former teacher of this course, I could go on and on and on about why it's amazing. So I'll try and control myself. Uh, this course is the equivalent of a fourth semester university course as evidenced by the literary genre shown here. It's almost exactly like the AP English literature course. The main difference being that it is obviously taught in Spanish and it comes with a prescribed reading list from the college board. Um, two obvious things are happening in the in this first year that we have this course developing a curriculum outline that's in compliance with the College Board audit and also preparing students for their tests in May. Um, and but within the classroom, students participate in literary discussions, Socratic seminars that prepare them to write about the literature that they're studying. And next year, um, we predict that we'll offer two full sections of the course, given the large number of AP Spanish language students we have this year, which is the prerequisite for that class. And in the new Mandarin 6 course at Middlesex begins with fundamentals of character writing by hand and on the computer and in pinyin, which is the romanization of Chinese characters, and hones in on proper pronunciation and understanding tones. And I also won't go into too much detail here because You've seen the proposal for that as well, but I do want to highlight um, what I've seen in in the classroom. And you know, when I when I walk in, I walk around, I ask students what they're doing and um, what they're learning, why they're learning it, if they understand it, and they are able to tell me in English. And despite their small stature, I mean, the only thing you would notice is you know how how small the students are, but they're able to 
speak Mandarin and write in Mandarin and and when our teachers up at the board and explains to students why characters go where they go they're able to understand it and they put it in their notebook and Mandarin instruction is very deliberate um and and it's just amazing seeing the difference it makes when they start so young and what they're able to do after such um, a short amount of time and I look forward to watching them dive deeper into the fundamentals of the language as they as they progress um, into the following years and I'll have more about that in in the coming slides so two new courses uh, for the coming school year at DHS Hispanic culture through film and Hispanic culture through art I presented the proposals for these a few months ago so just the broad strokes today they're both Spanish five classes can be taken in any order depending on student interest and allow students to do three things so one they can continue their language study without taking an AP course they can take an additional year of language before AP Spanish language or take a fourth year course of a language after AP Spanish language if they choose to not go into AP Spanish literature and we look forward to developing our students speaking and writing skills in these courses furthering uh, further developing interdisciplinary connections through the lens of film and the arts and giving our students choice this is really a, a great way to give them some choice in in content and as you know we're also be, uh, bringing on american sign language one at dhs next year and moving on to the next phase of mandarin at middlesex with mandarin seven my um, at my new course presentation in november I was asked to give some predictors for enrollment for these courses. And while I don't know exact numbers because we just began um, with registration at both schools, I predict the following and hopefully I'm right, just like I was right about CLV literacy last year. But um, for American Sign Language, uh, we predict one section of 18 to 22 students, which is the um, average number of students in each class at DHS. And again, this is pure speculation, just based on emails I've received, student interest, um, questions from parents and students, and conversations with counselors who sort of have the pulse on what kids are interested in and, and what they're registering for. And after we get hard numbers, I'll be able to project outward into the future as they show interest in, in continuing. So hopefully this is um, like learning any language, you know, committing and, and continuing and spending time is, is really important. Um, and in November in 2021, Dr. Dahlstrom and I presented a memorandum to the board with a phased rollout of Mandarin at MMS in years one, two, and three. So as we move on to the following years, this would be year two. Um, the Based on the success of the first year, because it's gaining so much attention, we predict two or three sections of Mandarin six for next year. And then the students that are currently in Mandarin six will move on to Mandarin seven um, with the 29 students that are currently enrolled in the program. So they move on to, to this class. And curriculum writing and revisions that are upcoming um, at the end of the school year and in the summer at Middlesex, Spanish, um, six and seven, French seven and eight, and Mandarin six and seven, and at DHS, French three, um, French three honors, Spanish three, Spanish three honors, and our new Spanish five culture through the arts class. And we've already completed French six and Spanish eight at Middlesex, and French two and two accelerated, and Spanish four and four honors um, at DHS. And an update on our international trips. Um, we leave for Ecuador and Galapagos in two months. So I'm really excited about that. You'll see me again in March for 2024 when I propose those trips. We project those a, about a year and a half out um, just so you know we can get students enrolled and make it affordable for families and really publicize these experiences. So I'd like to end with a photo um of our students and chaperones in Sevilla in Spain last April it was a scorching hot day on top of Las Setas one of the tallest structures in the city and the only place over the course of the 10 days we were abroad that was large enough to get us all in mm -hmm. one single photo and you'd think that a group this large would attract a lot of attention um, but to be honest we didn't um, not only not only is Spain accustomed to young tourists but our students 
really made a sincere effort to speak Spanish, followed social norms and customs. Uh, we did have dinner before 10 p.m. Uh, we, that was the only one we, we didn't really follow, but um, they really made us proud by blending in and doing as Spaniards do. And I've traveled with students abroad um, several times in my career, but of all those experiences, um, this was um, the best one I've ever had. The largest group I've ever traveled with. Everyone thought um, we were nuts for going. It's a pandemic. They thought we were crazy, um, but we did it. And uh, two statements stick out in my mind. Um, I didn't think I'd want to study abroad in college, but now I want to study here. And it took me two days, but all the Spanish in my brain finally came out. <laughs> so the trip was several years in the making and in the waiting. And because of your support and community support and student interests, my amazing colleagues that uh, believed in the program and wanted to experience it for themselves, gave up their time to travel with us. Um, it finally happened and the program's off the ground and with eyes on the future. So I look forward to coming back in March to do uh, 2024. And that's it. So thank you. And I will take questions. Thank you, Christina. Um, how many people do you have going to the Galapagos and to Italy this summer? 22 to Galapagos and 24 to Italy. Great. Yeah. Students. Well, students and then we right. have chaperones. Right. Yeah. Questions for Christina about world language. Tara, do you have anything? I'm looking at you, but yeah, there you go. There's your hand. Sorry, I, not really a question. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation and I really appreciate the additional AP. You know, as we spoke earlier, you know, it's hard for students at the high school to really take electives and do what they want because colleges do expect a certain amount of APs. And in the past, you know, even the two English APs didn't exist, what, six years ago? Mm -hmm. So it's always been very math science based. And for kids that aren't that math science person, um, it's really not fun to get all those APs for colleges. So I really appreciate this. Yeah, thank you. Julie. Thank you. Um what just happened? The can't hear anything again. I'm not sure what happened. The BOE booth is muted. We're good. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us? Okay. okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so Yes to all of those. So most students at DHS take a world language. I think the last time I checked, it was like 1,100. I'm currently enrolled. I don't know. I didn't dive that deep into the data, although I will now because I'm a nerd about that kind of stuff. But um, most take a world language. Most take it for three or four years. And the reason, you know, I've been here for a little while now, and I see, you know, the numbers go up and up and up. And I always have the conversation like, why are the numbers growing up? Because we have the same number of kids. It's, it's not that we have more students physically coming into the high school. It's just that they stay mm -hmm. and they stay because they see, you know, the tangible effects of what they can do when they stay for that long. And yes, there's seal of biliteracy at the end. There are AP classes, there are level five classes, there are trips. There are all these great things that you can do, but um, when you're somewhere and you hear someone speaking the language that you're learning and you understand it, that's like, oh my God, what I'm doing in class is doing something for me. So they just, they stay for a long time. And they, they also stay because they can, and that's uh, through Christina's advocacy for these, those two five classes, you're not going to see those in most places. So those are there because students need a place to go because they are uh, completing the AP course as many of them as juniors. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, most of them as juniors now. And they don't have to do that in order to access these classes. They might take, there's so many pathways for them to stay engaged in the program and not feeling like if I don't take an AP, then then I have to either take another language or not take mm -hmm. any more. Uh, and that's through 
uh, Christina's advocacy and program design. Cool. So it seems like our language program is quite robust, especially with the addition of Mandarin at the middle school and hopefully with the addition of ASL. Is in relation to our DERG, are there are there other how do we fare in terms of our offerings and are there things that you wish we could offer but don't have the space time budget? Um, I would say that it's about um, the same, but in many ways better. Um, considering the size, it's it's a relatively large high school, but it's not that big. Um, considering the size, we do a lot and we have a lot of students enrolled. So um, we there are schools in our DERG that have an ASL program. There are schools in our DERG that start Mandarin in the younger grades. Um, there are schools in our DERG that don't have elementary world language, but then they also don't have the results that we have on seal of bioliteracy. And that's really not to say like, oh, everyone takes Spanish. It's students have a choice when they get to middle school, they can change when they get to high school, they can change. But the point is they're accustomed to being in a world language classroom. And so they know what it takes to learn another language as well. Um, I, as far as wishes go, um, I can't really say that I would, I wish for something different or for something more. Um, I wish, and I, I hope that I will continue to have the support to make, um, changes as things evolve and recommendations as, as things change. But I would say we're in a really, really good place. And in our dirt, we have a PLC of the Dirk A, we call it A plus because we include Greenwich and Norwalk as well in our in our in our PLC. And you know, we're constantly sharing ideas and numbers and what's going on in your program. And that's really how our program grows because we see other schools doing really good things and we say, let's see if we can make that happen also. Yeah. Sure, there's one more question. If you could look back into your crystal ball real quick mm -hmm. um, for ASL, do you mm -hmm. have any feeling on are those students who are not taking a world language who will be coming into the world language program? Some of them will be. Yep. Some of them will be who, especially when we take them in in ninth grade, many students at Middlesex who don't currently take a language because of the program that they're in will opt in to that program and hopefully stay. And their staying in it will allow us to project out into, into the future. Um, I also predict that we'll have students at DHS who will continue on with the language that they're currently taking and add ASL, which will make for a really interesting, interesting mix of, of students, ages and ability levels, which will be great too. Um, but I won't be able to look that deeply into my crystal ball without first having, you know, a group that I can work with. Yeah. And I did want to say thank you for the, the Spanish five courses, because having a couple of high schoolers as they register, you know, for classes mm -hmm. each year, you're looking for a balance, right? Not every student is looking to take five AP classes yeah. at a time, so to speak. So it's great to have yeah. options, both mm -hmm. AP and no. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, Dr. Adler. Yeah, I just wanted to, want want obviously recognize Christina's um, leadership in this capacity, but I also just want to, and I know the board agrees to and have supported this. Um, but these international trips uh, and international experiences and travel experiences, there's no greater opportunity you get to learn something as as to travel together and and to bond together as a group as you hustle through uh, airports. <laughs> um, but I, I want to just recognize because they don't come with a commitments planning commitment to uh, the actual experiences. And then many, many times our staff, including Christina, have to bear with uh, and our students too some, what we all do with inconveniences for travel from loss of luggage to having to stay with students who are sick and so on and so forth. So often their experiences maybe even extend beyond the time period. So I just want to recognize mm -hmm. those and support them and uh, appreciate the board support for these every year because I think they're uh, an integral part of the actual program and experience. It's exciting. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Uh, Tara, you're, are we good? Good. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to our third agenda item, which is public comment. Michelle. Good morning. Anyone in person would like to participate? 
please step to the podium. You have three minutes to comment. Please state your name and address for the record. Good morning. My name is Caitlin Cahill and I live at 27 Devon Road. I am the advocacy chair for Darien Advocates for Education of the Gifted. On behalf of DAEG, we would like to thank the administration for the thoughtful review of the IDEA program and considerations for programmatic improvements. Our students in grades two to nine derive tremendous value from the program, and we appreciated hearing more about how to make it even better for our gifted learners. We plan to review this presentation and solicit feedback from our families for a collective response. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Sarah Gortel, 22 Brushy Hill Road. Um, two quick comments. One is just on Latin. I don't. I know there's other schools in the drug that do offer an AP option for that, and I was just wondering if there's any consideration, kind of in the future, as more Latin students move through. Um, so that's thought one. Thought two. I just thought of a minute ago when we were talking, Julie, that question about um, ASL and and the, your comment about taking it like an addition, just thinking of it as an elective. I don't think that really in the other presentations kind of came up that the idea of students taking two language and just um how is it a full semester is it a full year um just thinking like how would that work it was the first time I've been in this room many times and just thinking of it um in that vein not just someone coming in and taking it but the idea that people would be taking it in lieu of another elective it's just something that I thought was interesting Go right ahead. Good morning. My name is Michael Cantwell. I have uh, two kids, one in seventh grade at MMS and one um, in Tokenique. Uh, I wanted to thank you again for the work on the gifted program. It's been um, something that um, we didn't have at our last school and we're very happy to have here. It was one of the reasons we, uh, we came here. So thanks for the continued work on that program. Um, a couple of times it came up earlier about competing priorities and time pressure on schedules. And I was wondering, just given how important that is and how limited that time is, if anyone has actually looked and done a study on a per grade basis as to how much time children are spending on specific priorities, how much time is being spent on math versus how much time is spent, uh, you know, having a healthy lunch, having physical activity, having time to study independently, having time to meet with a teacher. There's a lot there. I sat down recently with my daughter's uh, schedule and went through how much time are you spending here and there? And I found a lot of time was being intended in one area and then redirected into something else. So I said, oh, flex. So what did you do in flex? Oh, well, that was, that was what I found out was SEL. Oh, what, so when did, what, when do you, when did you have time to make that up so it, it, that never came up also during the same week i found out that she got pulled out of science class she got pulled out of math class to attend the program that was about sel i think it was an artist probably a very uh, very nice program but if i had the choice i wouldn't have pulled her out of math and science class to do that program so i'm asking if we could take a deliberate careful look at how kids are spending their time. I think some of these things get thrown in at the last minute. We have uh, somebody has a great idea and it gets thrown into the agenda, but we don't really look at what's being given up. Either that or it's deliberate and um, it means that we should have a more careful and open dialogue about how time is being spent. You know, we all we all do this in our daily lives. You know, sometimes when we look back, we said, well, geez, if I had that week to do over again, I wouldn't have spent that much time doing this, I would have spent more time doing that. I'm, um, so I'm both asking and volunteering if we need help to do that. I'm glad to volunteer. I'll you know, provide some personal time if we wanna, however you wanna do it, but I think it, it clearly needs to be done. I've listened to a lot of these meetings and nobody's ever said, well, we have this much time for this area and this is why we can or cannot add this additional program or this is why this program is gonna get bumped. It seems you know, simple just to see, because I, I was surprised a lot when I looked at uh, my middle schoolers, seventh grade schedule, a lot of time being spent in places where, um, you know, 
some things being prioritized over others. That's really the main point. So thanks again. And really, I, I mean it. If, if I can help, um, I would be glad to. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, no. We oh, sorry, there's online. people online. Sorry, I can't see if there's anybody there. Sartori, you are unmuted and recognized. Hi, this is Clara Sartori. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, the gifted program, a couple of things. One, um, you mentioned the um, OSAT and um, the fact, I think somebody said the scores don't change all that much. But then during the presentation, you also mentioned that there's a pretty good influx of students into um, the program between fifth and sixth grade. So I guess I wondered, are there different um, things that happen for students between fifth and sixth grade that maybe make them eligible for the program and um, that, that aren't reflected in a change in their scores? Um, so that's one question. I wondered if maybe that could be part of something you report on later on. And also the Johns Hopkins talent search, um, is your program, does the program um, identify or pick up students who might be interested in that? And are there students who aren't in the gifted program who also might have test scores or other qualifying factors that might allow them to participate in the Hopkins program? Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thanks, Clara. Sorry to overlook you. There are no more raised hands at this time. Okay, now may I have a motion to adjourn. Julie, seconded by myself, <laughs> and we are dismissed. We are adjourned. Sorry, I'm my old teacher. You're dismissed. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a